having embarked on a remarkable journey from distinguished roles within the U.S. Air Force and Space Foundation to her current position as the CEO and founder of SB Global LLC. Shelley's leadership acumen is exceptional. An aspiring chef in disguise, avid adventurer and travel enthusiast, capturing the cosmos and the world, and storyteller with a mission. With over 200 interviews for What Space Got To Do With It series, she has enough fascinating stories to fuel an intergalactic campfire chat and inspire the next generation of dreamers. Welcome, Shelley, to the series. The series is called The Women of Space, and indeed, it's my pleasure to talk to somebody, interview somebody who wears so many hats, and that is something very interesting. You are a chef in disguise, you're a storyteller, you are an uh, I can see you're a published author, and besides that, you have done something great in the space industry. You're a thought leader. What a wonderful opportunity for me to speak to you. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be with you. All right. Um, Shelley, in using the space industry language, uh, what would be your uh, blast of moment which basically launched you in the space industry as a leader? What would you describe that? Well, that is a wonderful question. And thank you so much. And I always like to say my journey has four chapters. And the chapter you're asking about is the second chapter of my life. And that's when I applied to become an officer in the Air Force. And they made me a space acquisition officer. And that started my 25-year career in the space industry. All right. Uh, but would you elaborate on that moment, how it happened? And uh, was it something expected? Uh, what I mean to understand is that this podcast would be viewed by a lot of people who are not from space industry, and uh, they would want to know this, the, that interesting story behind it. Absolutely. So I'll tell a little bit more about my journey. So that first chapter of my journey is when I enlisted in the U.S. Air Force right out of high school. I didn't have uh, college money. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to study. So I joined the U.S. Air Force so I could see the world, which is something that I was very passionate about. And during that time, the Air Force made me a personnel specialist. So I was human resources. I was stationed in Turkey and Germany, and I was able to go to school at night and complete my college education. And by doing that, that allowed me to then apply to become an officer in the Air Force. And so I applied to become an officer. I was selected and I really uh, wanted to be a personnel officer because that's what I had been doing. I, I knew everybody in personnel. I knew personnel. But the Air Force decided that I needed to be a space acquisition or space procurement officer. So it was not expected. I really didn't know what it was. I didn't really want it. But, you know, when you're in the military, you just salute smartly and say, yes, sir, and take on that next assignment. And I'm so fortunate that that happened because that really launched my space career. And as you mentioned, a lot of times people wonder how you come into the space industry. So I'm both a traditional space person and a non-traditional space person. And what I mean by that is many people come into the space industry through the military or civil space like a, a NASA or European Space Agency. So I came in that traditional route through the military, but I'm also non-traditional because normally in the past, space experts were STEM professionals, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, I actually have a business degree and an MBA. So I'm also the non-traditional space which we've seen really flourish over the last decade about space commercialization. So it's an exciting time to be part of the space industry. On that wonderful note, since you defined traditional and non-traditional arena in a very beautiful manner, what do you see or how do you see the future of women in space unfolding? Also, from your experience, share a couple of challenges that you faced uh, from a women's perspective, and uh, what for young girls, uh, you know, the space industry holds? Well, there's so many opportunities, and I want to say that throughout my career, I've always had opportunities. But when we think back, let's think back to the Apollo era, uh, more than 60 years ago, we can look at what that workforce looked like. You know, it was two nations in a space race. They were STEM professionals, and they were primarily male. And now when we fast forward 60 years to the Artemis, because now we're the twin sister of Apollo is Artemis. And with Artemis, we're returning to the moon and then on to Mars. 
under Artemis program, you're seeing a very different workforce. You're seeing more than 90 countries are operating in space. Many more want to operate in space. You're seeing a diversity of career fields, like I shared we still need STEM professionals and rocket scientists and astronauts, but we also need marketing and media and public relations and business and entrepreneurs and investors. So we have a lot of opportunity. We're also seeing a great opportunity for all ages, you know, senior professionals like myself, mid-career, who might want to transition into the space industry now and early career. And then, of course, we see a lot of women um, joining the space industry, both in the military, commercial, and international, as well as civil. So there's really a lot of opportunity to look at that space industry. Well, wonderful. Talking about space industry, let's talk about what space got to do with it. Um, I think it is uh, somewhere around you interviewed 200 people and 100 motivational talks on your own. Is, is that the number that we're talking about? Oh, um, okay. We, of course, we would love to know about all of them. But here, um, any specific story that is very close to your heart or, you know, it's, it's something that you just cannot stop talking about? Or you quote a lot. Well, thank you again. It's so wonderful to get, listen to other people's journeys and their motivational story. I love being that storyteller and sharing that story. And so what I did is before I started writing the book, I interviewed those 200 global thought leaders. So some of them are presidents of countries, some are in policy, some are in space, some are in um business, some are entrepreneurs. So not everybody was in the space industry. And I interviewed people from around the world, men and women, all ages, all backgrounds. And then as I went through and started writing the, this first book, which is called 10 Life Lessons for Personal Growth, I really shared parts of my, my journey. But then I shared three thought leader stories in each chapter. So not only do you hear my story, but then you hear stories and insights from three global thought leaders in each chapter. And what this highlights is that what I've learned in the space industry is really universal. It's not unique to the space industry. You know, the number one, uh, chapter one talks about taking advantage of opportunities. You know, and sometimes opportunities look like work or taking on the hard project or volunteering for things. So what I learned by interviewing many people was, they all, all those things, taking advantage of opportunities worked for them too. So that was what I really learned during this is that the space journey is not unique, that these life lessons will work for anyone. And I'm now working on uh, the second book, which is called What Space Got to Do With It, An Interstellar Guide to Success. Because the first question after people read the first book is, well, how do I get into the space industry or any industry? How do I make that happen? And so the Interstellar Guide to Success is, is a roadmap that helps you accomplish your goals and objectives. Wonderful. Um, well, we are on the subject of books and uh... I might be wrong, but my research says that you have also written a cookbook. Is that correct? <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I took a moment to realize that my research might be wrong, so it might be a wrong question. But is that a correct question? And if that is correct, then I will frame my question. Well, there's always correct questions. So I will say that, yes, your question is wonderful. And yes, that is true. I did write a cookbook. And... Uh, from that cookbook, I would really want to understand that when when it is talking about, is it actually talking about kitchen? It is actually a cookbook, and I will share a little bit. When I worked on the U.S. Capitol Hill, I was a legislative liaison for the U.S. Air Force working on Capitol Hill. What I did to help raise money for a nonprofit charity is I went around and collected recipes from everybody that I worked with, consolidated them into a cookbook, and then sold the cookbook and then donated the money to help this charity. So uh, the cookbook wasn't like my recipes, although there are a few recipes from my husband. He's the cook of our family, and he's from Texas and he was a firefighter so he makes the best chili in the world um, and he won the chili cook-off on Capitol Hill but I also um, helped raise awareness about that nonprofit and this was a nonprofit called the Yellow Ribbon and it was to help wounded uh, warriors uh, with their medical and transition in their families and so we raised money to help that nonprofit. While, while compiling this cookbook um... Any sort of leadership lesson that you learned that later on helped you in the boardroom when there is like the ratio of male versus female is is not uh, how exactly it should be. And that lesson really helped you. 
Well, I think the lesson that's really helpful and it's threefold and I call it listening, learning, and then leading. And many times when we are in a meeting, whether you're men or women, or it, it doesn't matter. Many times we don't listen to understand. We listen to respond. And when we don't fully listen to understand, then we're not able to really connect with people and share a message and find common goals. And so writing the cookbook was one of those, you know, sharing the message of how writing the cookbook and you supporting it and providing your recipe or buying cookbooks was helping this nonprofit. So you have to listen first to really understand where people are coming from. Then you learn and then you're able to lead and create a common goal. So those are some of the things that I learned from writing the cookbook, but also just in life in general. Lovely. Uh, the next question, I've actually framed it for you, so I'm going to read it out. You're a storyteller and a cosmic explorer. Here is the question. If you could photograph one moment in the space industry's future, say uh, 10 years from now, what do you hope to see in that frame? You can tell me some moment from your past as well. Uh, it's totally up to you. So if I understand correctly, it's what do I see maybe in the next 10 years? Um, and yes. so as a futurist, I think one of the things we need to look at is where will we be in the next 10 years? And so we can really see the advancement of deep technology, artificial intelligence, quantum. We can also look at how that will revolutionize uh, jobs. You know, how will we embrace AI, artificial intelligence, into our daily lives? I mean, I'm already using it. You know, we talked earlier, I have a note taker. Uh, that's my um, executive assistant. I use um, artificial intelligence to help me expedite with reviewing and editing and uh, posting things. So there's a lot of ways we're already using artificial intelligence and how that's going to exponentially grow. But then I think let's look at the bigger thing. What does that tangibly mean to people? So when we think about space, a lot of times people think about astronauts and rockets, and that's certainly about space. But the majority of space is about benefiting life on Earth with Earth observation and agriculture, telecommunications, um, monitoring resources on Earth, uh, wildlife and human trafficking mitigation and more. So we're really using space in our daily lives. On average, you connect with a satellite around 45 times a day. And so as we look into the future 10 years and we return to the moon and this time to stay to do research as well as commercialization, we're going to really see the development of that cislunar economy, which is between the Earth and the moon. And what does that look like and how does that continue to benefit life on Earth? What are we going to learn? So some of the things we're already learning by doing research in microgravity environments, such as the International Space Station, is we're looking at how do we solve cancer? How do we uh, cure blindness? How do we do other um, healthcare applications? And we're able to do a lot of that more efficiently in space. Then when you add the abilities of artificial intelligence to that, it's going to revolutionize like the medical industry and so many other things. So I don't want to go too deep into it, but just starting to pull the thread of artificial intelligence, the future of space and innovation and how that benefits humanity, it's really hard to fathom, but it's going to be exponentially great. And I'm looking forward to that. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing through SB Global LLC, being the bridge from the space industry to the general public so I can explain how space is benefiting people every day and why it's important that we're investing in the space industry. Great. Um... Yeah, I do understand that uh, all the examples that you have given and the usage of AI, the larger purpose is to give better life to human race. That is the larger purpose. Um, talking about the high-end organizations that you have worked in past, which is NASA, ESA, and UN as well, um, you can quote one or maybe two surprising lessons, like the lessons that you never thought uh, that would come your way. Um, just just share something like that with us. Well, I think one of the wonderful things that I've done, I've worked on both a NASA and a European Space Agency future study, like where will NASA or the European Space Agency be in 2050 and how do they work to pivot to get there it was really exciting. And it wasn't just the uh, understanding the future, but it was really the other individuals, the global thought leaders that I got to work with that were so amazing and building those relationships. And then those individuals became people I interviewed for the books and the series and became part of the 200 global thought leaders. So I'm going to share something that I learned when I worked on Capitol Hill. The first day I went to work on Capitol Hill, my boss said to me, life is all about relationships. 
building and maintaining relationships. And so no matter what you're doing, whether you're a rocket scientist or an astronaut or media or a global thought leader, life is all about building relationships. And that's how we create not only our personal life, but our professional life. And so that's the one takeaway I'll share with you that during all those activities is I was able to build my personal relationships. That is an interesting thought. Making relationships, building relationships, and it is, yes, equally important to to maintain them. Shelly, uh, throughout the conversation, if if you think that there is some important question that I have missed from my point of view, and you would love, you would have loved to answer that, uh, feel free to to give us some other insight. Absolutely. Well, let me give you a little sneak peek into the next book, which is that What Space Got to Do With It, An Interstellar Guide to Success. And it has a few steps. And so I'll just share those as a teaser. That first one is about leadership. And it's about building your leadership for self-leadership. So really understanding yourself, doing a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. How do you build on your strengths? How do you mitigate your weaknesses? How do you find those opportunities? And once you really understand yourself and self-leadership, because you're the CEO of your own company, then you're ready for the next step. And that's about awareness. Once you know about yourself, then you can start to build awareness about what's out there. What are the opportunities? Who are the people you can connect with? What are the next steps? And then that third phase is finding the access points. You know about yourself. You've done self-leadership. You've built the awareness. Now it's time to find the access points so that you can make your way into that next step in your journey, whether it's coming into the space industry or something else. And then the final step is taking action. So those four steps are self-leadership, building awareness, finding the access points, and then taking action. Lovely. That's very crisp and very interesting. And indeed, uh, it's it's to the point to a lot of people who are not even direct, directly related to space industry. Uh, on the parting note, uh, is there something that you would like to say? Because the series is specifically designed for women of space or women in space. Uh, young girls, um, I would not say like me, but somebody who is not from space, somebody who is an artist, somebody who is not from science background, and what is the non-traditional way that the route that they can take to get into space industry? There are so many pathways, and that interstellar guide to success is one of the roadmaps that will help you find your way. I know people who are musical composers who have found their way into the space industry using their artists and talent. Uh, Dr. Cyan Proctor, who was a SpaceX astronaut, she got her seat on SpaceX by writing poetry. She's an artist. So don't worry if you're an, if you're not a traditional space person that's building rockets or an astronaut in the traditional sense you can find your way into the space industry no matter what career you're in whether you're an entrepreneur or an innovator you're an investor you're a teacher you're a TEDx speaker you're media you're policymakers program managers there's a place for you in the space industry follow that interstellar guide to success do that self leadership Find, uh, build the awareness. Google is such a wonderful tool in chat GPT. Find the access points and then take action. So there's never been a better time to be in the space industry. What a lovely note to end this uh, this this episode of Women of Space. Thank you so much, Shelley. It was indeed lovely talking to you. All your responses, all your answers were crisp, yet very interesting and to the point. It was great talking to you. The pleasure's been mine. And until next time, I look forward to seeing you around the galaxy. Thank you so much.